we can see what happens. Um, I'm gonna have to change how I end class because it just has to do with how Zoom works. Um, I'm gonna have to actually kick everybody out at the end um, and then restart um, for my office hours. Uh, Zoom does not back up like what we're doing now, my recording until I end the meeting. Um, and then it starts backing it up. And when I use this overhead thing, it takes almost an hour for it to back it up. Um, I don't know why, it just this takes up so much space. Um, and, and then it takes like a half hour to upload. And so I'm getting to bed after 11 o'clock. And so um, when I get done, I'm gonna actually end you guys will all get kicked out and then I'll start it again. It actually lets me start the same meeting, but it will start backing it up and then I can start it again. So you can all go take a five minute break, which is really good. You all have your cameras off anyway. Um, and those of you who do, I also wanted to make a really quick comment because several of you have been leaving your cameras on or when you come um, or when you leave, you turn your camera on and say bye. And that actually means all the world to me. And so I'm deeply grateful. Um, yeah, it's it's really hard on my end um, when you're all just black boxes. So uh, recognizing my humanity is much appreciated by those of you who do turn them on. Major was in my class when we were, I was like a live person and he was a live person. So it's probably part of why he leaves his on because he sees that. All right, we're gonna do titrations. Titrations are awesome. This is usually uh, the, Initially, students aren't fond of this lab, and then they just do really great. Uh, it's very affirming because when you get your results, you know right away if you did well because you can crunch numbers. Um, there's a there's possibility we may be in lab this summer, and in the summer we do three titrations, so that'll be fun. Um, I, I'm well aware we'll be doing a big learning curve in lab in the summer, but I'm hopeful that at least some of us will be able to be back in lab. We have to start somewhere at some point. All right, so a titration is a very precise way. It's very precise and accurate method um, to, uh, usually it's to find molarity or to find percent in an unknown. Um, I lost the word I wanted to use. It, it's usually to find a concentration, to determine a concentration of something. So concentration, typically we think of molarity, but can also be a percent. Uh, that That is actually a really accurate picture of what it looks like. So a burette is a really tall, thin tube. Uh, this is not what happened to me, actually, was this guy celebrating. Uh, and so it's a very precise way. And so you add whatever is in this burette. This is called a burette. It's spelled different ways. We'll spell it that way. Uh, and you add it dropwise to what's in this flask. This is a flask. And you look for a color change. And so that's the key is you will see a color change. So the color change is always when you hit the stoichiometry. Um, and that's why the lab I videotaped, um, I actually want to show you one of the titrations and then you see all my numbers to crunch the data. Um, but it is when the stoichiometry, when the balance equation is perfect. There is no excess or limiting reagent. They are perfectly balanced at that point. So if you know one of them, you can solve for the other one. So if you know one reactant, you can figure out the other reactant. Um, and so that's why there, it's a very precise art. Um, and it is exactly as the color changes that drop. Um, you can't add five more drops because then you miss the stoichiometrically perfect point. All right, so let's go through um, some sample calculations. So what this is, is just more calculations with what we've been doing. The difference is we are gonna be using that big M. 
So, what does that big M mean? Molarity. Molarity. What does molarity mean? Go ahead, Spencer. Uh, moles per liter. Yes. So whenever you see the big M, you're going to change it to moles per liter to be able to use it in the factor label. Uh, and you're going to see it in all of these. So basically, we are doing our factor label with molarity. Uh, all right. And I forget that was Spencer. So we have 45.72 milliliters of sulfuric acid of 0 0.5005 molar sulfuric acid. And we're going to neutralize. So that word neutralize we're going to become familiar with this week. Um, it means react. It's, it's a fancy word for reacting. Uh, and we're going to react with 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. So to be able to do this, we do need a balanced equation. Now, the news I have for you, we're doing math tonight. And some of you have learned to embrace math. I personally love math because working with numbers, I can get to an answer and see if I'm on the right track. Uh, what that means is your study set for Thursday. I did post it today. I apologize for the delay. Um, it is It is math. The answers are there. Um, and then we'll be doing more reactions on Thursday. So we need, in the, in the study set, I give you the balanced equation. On this, um, so it means it's a, it's a challenging worksheet because it's all math. Um, but it's also good because you'll get practice with that. And then there's always a bonus on the worksheet. So there's forgiveness. Um, so I think most of the reactions are there. All right, um, we're going to write balanced equations here. So sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide. Sulfuric acid, H2SO4. So it's sulfate. If you like a parenthesis, you can put it. Um, a real chemist would not, but I'm not a real chemist, so none of us are real. Um, that's quantum mechanics. We're not there yet. So I need two hydrogens because the sulfate's a negative two. Put your charge if you like. And then plus, that's what neutralized means, plus sodium hydroxide. So NaOH. And if you want to put a parenthesis around the OH, you can. Sodium's a plus one. OH is a minus one. Um, arrow. And it's a double, so we're going to swap. So the sodium is going to go with the sulfate, Na2SO4. Uh, and the hydrogen and hydroxide go together. Neutralized means that we're going to make water, that water is a product. Uh, that is something we'll talk about more on Thursday, but it was a question like Aricella, you had asked me earlier. When you see that word neutralize, it means an acid plus a base. One of your products is water. Um, so you can write it as H2O or HOH. That's kind of a preference. I'm going to write it as HOH just because. And then you balance. You have two sodiums. So we need a two over here. Uh, that gives me two OHs and two hydrogens. So I get two waters. You can write, again, H2O or HOH. All right. We'll worry about states matter on Thursday. So that's our balanced equation. Practice with balanced equations. Again, on your study set and worksheet, the equations are given to you. So where do we start? Well, we're trying to solve for The question wants us to, to figure out the concentration of sodium hydroxide. Um, that means molarity. So concentration means molarity. If it's wanting a percent, it will say, what is the percent? Um, usually I do say, what is the molarity? But sometimes I forget and I'll say, what is the concentration? So we're trying to find the moles per liter. Again, in factor label, rather than writing molarity, we're trying to find the moles per liter of the sodium hydroxide. All right. So we're going to start with the other one. We're going to start with the sulfuric acid. 
So we know these two pieces of information. I'm going to start with the 45.72 milliliters. Uh, if you want, you can write label that's H2SO4. And we're going to want to get to liters. With molarity, we use liters, so milliliter to liters. That step, you can just make it nice and little, and you don't have to label everything. And then we can do our liters to moles of H2SO4. That is the molarity. That's the 0 0.5005 that was given in the problem. All right, so they may see the next step. I'm going to go from moles to grams. Not to grams. Somebody else had it. Mole to mole. It is our mole to mole step. So from our balanced equation. Uh, and that's why we like to write. So that's actually, I'm really glad you answered it like that major. Um, that is actually the thing to realize with these. There's no need to go to grams. In this question, we don't have to use the periodic table at all. Well, if you don't know your charges, you want to. Because um, there's nothing asking about grams. There's, we're not starting with grams anywhere, and we're not asking for grams. So we want to do our mole to mole. Moles of H2SO4 to moles of NaOH. So there is with molarity, when we did molarity problems before also, sometimes we did not have to use grams. Uh, and so one mole to two moles of NaOH. All right, so we're done with the sulfuric acid. Now, this is back to a question, um, Daniela, you had asked me earlier when we were working with the percent problems. There is, There are two different ways you can handle this next step. So we got to the moles of the NaOH. We need a volume, and this volume does also have to be of the NaOH. So this volume here, this milliliters, that actually was of the H2SO4. I didn't label this on the bottom, but it will help for a lot of you. So we need to bring in the volume of NaOH, um, and that is the 20 milliliters in the problem. This first question is actually probably the hardest question because there's two volumes involved. The other ones have masses, so it will take out one of the volumes. That second volume, you can eat, do one of two things, and it's a preference. You can put it here in the denominator. Um, it's going to go in the denominator. So you can say I have 20.00 milliliters, but again, label it. It's the NaOH. Um, and then you're going to have to go milliliters to liters, or you could have brought it in here by itself with nothing above it. Um, some people like that. So a milliliter is 10 to negative 3 liters. The milliliter cancels, but the NaOH is still there um, with the liters. We have moles of NaOH, and you should get my answer. I made a comment that titration is very precise. If you look at all the numbers on this page, everything's four sig figs. In lab, all the numbers I work with are four sig figs. Um, I actually have to go use a special balance in lab that allows me to use four sig figs. Burettes are actually pretty expensive because the gnomes very precisely uh, put gradations on them to give us four sig figs. Graduated cylinders only allow three sig figs. So it's a way to very precisely determine Anyway, so that's one example. Um, all right, we are in another equation. So questions, why does I keep going? 50 milliliters of 0 0.4500 molar hydrochloric acid. So this is our first piece of information. And again, colors are really helpful. And it's added to excess sodium carbonate. Um, so we need to write an equation of the hydrochloric acid with the sodium carbonate. So hydrochloric is still HCl, and sodium carbonate is Na2CO3. Uh, carbonate has a negative 2, so I need two sodiums. 
We're going to spend Thursday on writing equations. And you guys seem to be getting those better, hopefully. But since the carbonate, I should show it, has a negative two. My sodium has a plus one. That's where my two came from. All right, it's a double. Isn't that wonderful? Doubles are awesome. They switch partners, so we get sodium chloride. Sodium's a one and chloride's a minus one. So there's a question a couple of people have asked me about diatomics. Um, Kobe, I think you asked me this today. The diatomic for chlorine in both these places, we ignore it because it's not by itself. So we don't want to put a two because these both have a one charge. So it's just NaCl. This is just HCl. So the diatomic thing is only when it's by itself. That's true for oxygen, hydrogen, whatever the diatomic is. Um, so the sodium went with the chlorine, the hydrogen is going to go with the carbonate, so it'd be H2CO3, and um, I'm just going to put a star here. We're going to deal with that one on Thursday. So that's our, our equation to be balanced. We need two sodium chlorides and two HCLs. All right. Um, so the question wants us to find how many grams of sodium chloride, so I'm going to write that, grams of sodium chloride are formed. Now, the sodium carbonate, that excess there means I don't care how much I used. We're just going to start with our hydrochloric acid and solve for the sodium chloride. The mass of the sodium carbonate doesn't matter. We just needed that to do our balanced equation. So if you're given the volume and the molarity, we'll start with the volume. So we have our 50 milliliters of our hydrochloric acid, so HCl. And I am going to pause for a moment and give you a chance to see if you can do it. You will have to go, you will have to use your periodic table for this one. All right, keep going if you're on track. If not, milliliter to liters, however you do your milliliter to liter step. I'm just trying to be consistent. We're working with the HCL, so now I bring in the molarity. So the 0 0.4500 moles per liter, always label your moles, HCl. If you want to label HCl over HCl, great. If you want to just label the top, that's fine. Once you get to moles, next step is our balance equation. And that's why I like to write down where I'm going. So I'm going to take moles of HCl, that's what unit I have, pull it down, and I want to go to sodium chloride, so moles in HCl. And then I use the numbers 2 and 2. I recommend that you write 2 and 2, and then you can cross them both out if you don't want you don't have to push them in your calculator um, but otherwise you write one is two and one is one and then it's not going to work all right that gets us the sodium chloride we just want to go right to grams so one mole of sodium chloride add up an na and a cl 58.44 grams the two already factored in here so we ignore the coefficient it only shows up in this step uh, when we use the periodic table, it's always one. So one sodium, one chlorine, and we punch it in, and you should get the 1.315 grams. Four sig figs. Um, questions? So it's just another variation on this theme. Um, that's one of the things that's kind of nice with the math. It's We're just using our balance equations, that mole-to-mole -mole step, and we're seeing something else 
that we actually did before with moles. All right, so the next one, kind of want to keep this in mind. This is the lab. We're going to go through a sample calculation. There's two parts to the lab, um, and we're going to do a sample calculation. So keep in mind you have it in your notes to refer back to. And the first part of the lab uh, is finding the molarity of the silver nitrate. So we're trying to find, the question showed up at the beginning. Let's go ahead and write down what we're trying to find, not just molarity, but molarity of the silver nitrate. Um, so what is the molarity of the silver nitrate? If it takes 29.35 mils to titrate, and then we have this many grams, 0 0.111, sorry, 0 0.1123 grams of sodium chloride. So that just followed to the end point. So that end point is the color change I was talking about. You end it right at the perfect color change. Um, and we always repeat it to make sure we did it right. Um, and that's why it's a really fun lab, because if you can repeat it and get the same answer two, three times, then you know you got it. Or else you kept making the same mistake. All right. Uh, we need a balanced equation. So let's go ahead and do it. Uh, sodium chloride and silver nitrate. Doesn't matter which comes first. They are the reactants. So NaCl and silver nitrate. It's actually a pretty simple equation because everything has a one charge. Sodium has a one, chloride has a one, silver has a one, and nick has a one. So when we balance it, everything's going to be ones. Um, the silver goes with the chloride, and the sodium goes with the nitrate. Now, just kind of because what's going on in the lab, the sodium nitrate is aqueous. Nicks are always aqueous. The sodium chloride um, is going to form a precipitate. It forms a white milky precipitate. And so as you're titrating, you keep forming this white milky precipitate. Um, so in the flask was the sodium chloride or the chloride, whatever the chloride is. The sodium doesn't actually matter, it turns out. And in the burette, for this lab, the one I videotaped, is the silver nitrate. And so the silver and the chlorine come together. We don't actually care about the nitrate either. It's the silver and the chloride are going to form this precipitate, which is this white milky precipitate. So it just keeps getting whiter and milkier and milkier and whiter until there's no more. And that's where there's a color change. And the color change happens because we add something called an indicator. And the indicator is something that will create a color change. So silver loves chloride. It preferentially binds to chloride. If there's a chloride, the silver is going to make silver chloride a white milky precipitate. But there is a point where there's no more of this. That the limiting reactant, we hit the point where they're exactly the same. Every silver ion has found every single chloride. You're adding the silver drop by drop. The next drop of silver you add, you can't find a chloride because there's no more. They've all precipitated. So it switches. Silver says, okay, I'll just go with the indicator. And it binds the indicator and the color changes. I can see it behind me and I don't know where it is. Uh, it changes into an orange color. Um, and eventually deep red um, if you add too much. And so as soon as you see that first orange color show up, you know all the chloride's gone and the silver has switched to its uh, bonding to. That's the idea of the lab. Um, it makes more sense when you can see the visual. So for the factor label, let's go ahead and some of you probably already did it. Our first step is grams, so we're going to go to moles, kind of our mantra in chemistry. 
So we already figured out it's 58.44 grams sodium chloride per mole. And our next step is the mole to mole step. We get to moles, balanced equation, we do a mole to mole step. That is the theme of the second celebration is it's all about chemical reactions. So all the math we're doing, there's a chemical reaction. So my equation is pretty simple. We do still show the switch, one mole of sodium chloride, and we're solving for silver nitrate, so one mole of silver nitrate. Now, back to the question earlier, we are not going to grams, though. I didn't ask for grams. I asked for molarity. So no need to go to grams, but we're not done. What do we still need? Grams cancel. Milliliters to 29.35. Yeah, where am I going to put major? Uh, under the 0 0.1123. So the volume needs to be in the denominator. So you can either show it like here by itself with nothing above it, or you can go back here and need to bring that 29.35. That 29.35 milliliters. That was what was in the burette. That is of the silver nitrate. Um, and we just have to change milliliters to liters. So my milliliter to, to liters, and you would punch it in and get my number. I'm extremely confident in my numbers because I've used this page forever. Um, you can write your answer as moles per liter, or you can write it as a big M. Um, I do recommend you label after it silver nitrate. So this would follow up to there. So that's, that's the first part of the math that we're doing tonight. All right. So in part A of the lab, What is going on is in part A, you're standardizing. It's a new big word. The silver nitrate. So that word standardizing means we're very precisely determining the molarity of the silver nitrate. We repeat it three times to make sure, yes, this is what it is. So... When somebody makes it up, it's always a rough estimate using graduated cylinders and stuff. Titration allows us to have the four sig figs. We standardize it, so now we know what this answer is. We're going to use this answer in part B. So part A, the answer for part A, we use in part B. All right, so in part B of the lab, we repeat this titration. The sodium chloride, by the way, is not what you buy in the store. It is pure sodium chloride. We actually paid big bucks for it many years ago. So it's 100% pure. Somebody did some kind of analysis. It's actually over 100%. That's how good it is. Um, you can think about that. So in part B of the lab, you're going to have an unknown. So we're trying to find the percentage of chloride in the unknown. And so we have this many grams of the unknown. So the problem is we can't start with that mass. So why can't we start with that mass? Because you don't know what it is. Yeah, we don't know what it is. So there's nothing we can do with it. We can't change its moles because it's a mixture. So an unknown means it's impure. Um, Sorry, I lose track at some point. So we're going to keep it. We're going to underline it. We're going to use it, though. So we're going to titrate with 33 milliliters of the above silver nitrate. So the perfect endpoint. So percent chloride means so we're trying to find the percentage of chloride. Um, it means we're trying to find the grams of chloride in the grams of the unknown times 100. This is like what we've been doing, the calculations on the first page of the homework. 
So that's what we're trying to find. Now we do know the grams of the unknown. That piece is known. What we're going to do is we're going to do our little factor label trick to figure out the grams of the chloride. All right. So start with the volume. So it's the 33.33 milliliters, and this is of the silver nitrate. And change it to liters. However you like to change to liters, or you just copy mine. All right, we got rid of the milliliters. We're at liters. The reason we went to liters so we could use this answer from up here, from part A. So 0 0.06547. The concentration of the silver nitrate is very low. Um, so you can put 0, 0.0, but just be careful, like everything we've been doing with the place value. Um, make sure you can see your decimal. And that is moles per liter of silver nitrate. And again, that was from part A. So in the lab, I did it three times, and then we take the average. All right, our next step is to change the silver chloride, sorry, the silver nitrate to chloride. Um, so the piece here to realize will make more sense after Thursday. Um, I mentioned it already, the nitrate doesn't matter in the reaction. So I'm going to do something. You, you don't have to do this or you can. The nitrate doesn't matter. And the sodium doesn't matter. All that mattered was the chloride ion and the silver ion. And they made this precipitate. So really, our reaction was uh, the chloride ion plus the silver ion made, sorry, silver chloride solid. Precipitate means solid. This is the reaction that happened. Um, it doesn't matter what type of chloride it was. So it could have been potassium chloride. It could have been lithium chloride. The unknown is actually a mix of a whole bunch of different ones. So we're not trying to figure out if it's sodium chloride, potassium chloride, we're just trying to figure out how much chloride there is. So our next step is for every one mole of the silver nitrate, we have one mole of chloride. And then we're going to go to grams of chloride. I have to move my things over. All right. Um, yeah, and so that's from this, the, um, yeah, we'll go there. So one mole of chloride, periodic table tells us chloride is 35.45 grams. That is just this number from the periodic table, the 35.45. It's on all of your periodic tables. Some of you have 35.453. That's great. Um, it's not a diatomic. So that's a really great question. Why is it not a diatomic here? Because it was part of a, it was a compound. Yeah, it's an ion. Because it's an ion, it came from a compound. It is chloride. Um, you can ponder that. I wrote my equation correctly. I showed it as an ion. When we show it as an ion, that's not a diatomic. That's where we're going this week. That's actually important. Um, you can punch this in and get your grams of chloride and then divide it by the 0. 0.111. One grams of the unknown times 100. So you can get a number, four sig figs, or if you like, 
you can take this number, the 0 0.111, and just put it under here. Just make sure you label it as the unknown. Again, this is a personal preference by you. I'll see about half of you do it each way, so it doesn't matter. You then, the specs that question earlier, Daniela, you asked, if you put it here in the problem, you just have to know when you get to the end that you're making it a percent. So you have to multiply by 100 and you will get my answer of 69.57%. So that's what part B is. Part B is the unknown um, percent chloride. Um, like every university does this lab. It's like the keystone learning to titrate. It's, it's a wonderful art. It makes you not afraid to do anything ever in lab. Um, and then you can go and help create vaccinations and all these other great things. Um, so my question for you guys to ponder is I have that we're going to do this lab next week. I don't know if it'd be better for me to post this lab for you guys to do it this week since it goes with what we're doing. Ponder that. Um, and then next week you can do the other lab that I have for you to do this week is my dilemma is because this week is Sherpa New Year. And so we're going to do a Sherpa New Year lab, which is you actually doing something in your kitchen. But um, we can do that one for next week. We can get this one over with crunching numbers so that it's fresh in your mind. So you have it. That's what I'm leaning towards. And then you can play in your kitchen. You refer to Sherpa New Year as your birthday? No, my birthday is in October. My birthday is on Fluffernutter Day. Made you remember oh. that, can see. Uh, no, Sherpa New Year. There's a video that goes with it that explains what Sherpa New Year. So the new moon is this Thursday. It's actually a really special new moon. Uh, the new moon in February is always the Tibetan Sherpa New Year. And so it um, is the biggest holiday. Uh, so I always do a special lab for it. It is usually um, later in the month. And it just happens to be, I was going to do that. I'm doing that lab with my other two classes this week. But it occurred to me that we should probably do this titration this week because it's really good practice of you getting it, getting it over with. But it doesn't matter to me. We can take a vote. All right, let's move on. And then somebody can tell me. Um, so basically, do you guys want to do number crunching and get it over with? Or do you want to do some kitchen chemistry fun science? We need fun in our life. Or do you want the fun one next week, something to look forward to? I don't know. When do you want to get the number crunching over with? Um, <laughs> Demons like me. It's like, oh, let's just do the fun one. Um, we can do the fun one. And and I'll post the titration one. It will just be in next week's folder. So you can get them both done this weekend. And then next weekend, you can have completely off. It's going to be raining and snowing this weekend. We're all going to be snowed in, right? All right. Um, we're going to talk about acids and bases because I'm pretty sure there's a question on your study set. So let's. Um, I added this page last year. In Chemistry 223, we spend half of that class on acids and bases. Um, we're going to do some chemical equations. We talked about neutralizing. Um, with acids, what you should all know about acids is they have that hydrogen ion, which is really a proton. So when we make hydrogen a plus one, it has zero electrons and 99.99% of hydrogen has zero neutrons. Uh, so when hydrogen loses its electron, it, it's basically a proton. And acids, they're going to burn. They're going to corrode things. Um, they are extremely useful. They were actually on the original periodic table with by the alchemists because they're so useful in lab. Um, they, they didn't have the concept of chemical compounds. Their periodic tables had a different meaning. So we're going to see hydrogens. We've seen a bunch of these. A base is something that will neutralize an acid. 
Um, another term for base is alkali. And we've seen that term alkali because the common um, bases, one of the key thing, not all bases, but where we're at to keep it simple, uh, we usually see hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, the 1As are called the alkali metals because they form the common bases. Um, so Major and Maria might be able to help me out here because I can't remember, I can't believe, I, I like, every time I hear it, I'm like, of course, but I'm pretty sure uh, Cali actually means base. So that prefix L is telling me it's an Arabic word. Um, and so I don't know if you know Major since, and so I think, that's where that word comes from and where the term base comes from. Do you know? I have no, I have no idea. Oh, okay. There is actually, you can, somebody can Google it. Um, and that's also part of where the word for potassium, the uh, Latin word for potassium I comes from. Huh? I didn't even know this part either. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Good, <are> you? <laughs> I'm Egypt and you can't help me on this one. Um, <laughs> All right, um, so the, the big thing about them and with this page has to do with pH. It just seems um, like almost a sin and a disservice on my part to have a whole term of chemistry, which half of you probably will only have one chemistry class your whole time and not mention pH. Um, and so pH is a little, it's read as pH, not, you don't say it like that, I had some mate have a whole conversation with me like that, not a good thing. It is a little P and a capital H, and what it stands for is, so little P, capital H, it stands for negative log of the hydrogen. That's incorrect, but we're gonna go with it. Um, so that little P means negative log. This is LOG log, log base 10, it's one of the two famous log scales. Uh, the pH scale turns out it's less than 100 years old or only about 100 years old. Um, I think the guy's name is Soren Sorensen or something like that, uh, came up with the pH scale as an easy way to talk about acids and bases. And it's really not that old. Um, I, I learned that from a Google Doodle when it was his birthday. So this formula is, what it is, you just punch it in your calculator. So the lie that I have to not perpetuate because I comment on it later on on this page, there is no such thing as a hydrogen ion because a hydrogen ion is a proton. Acids do not ionize. So you put sodium chloride in water, they become sodium ion and chloride ion. Acids don't do that. When you put HCl in water, what happens is the water pulls them apart. And so what you get is the hydrogen goes with the water. It stays there. The water pulls it apart and keeps the hydrogen. So you actually get hydronium. You get this ion, which is called hydronium. So you're gonna see on the rest of this page, I took this page from my 223 notes just to do an introduction of what pH is uh, and chloride. So the chloride's a regular ion. Nobody except in the chemistry class talks about hydronium. So like in biology and anatomy and everybody talks about it as negative log of hydrogen. So you can say that, that's fine. Um, I, I'm just gonna be saying hydronium um, because the water pulls it apart and holds on to it. So if you see this ion show up in the notes, don't panic, just say, oh, that's just an H2O with the hydrogen. That's really what happens. Um, there is also a scale called the POH scale. Uh, and again, it's a little P and a capital OH. And it is negative log also, because that little P just means negative log of hydroxide. The other famous log scale is the um, earthquake, the Richter scale. So every tenfold, 
every one point change in pH is a tenfold change. So a pH difference between two and five is actually a thousand fold change. Um, so it's a big change. It's not just like one little step. Like a earthquake two, we have them all the time here, right? Because we're in the volcanic zone. Uh, and so you don't really feel them. But if we had an earthquake level five, we none of us would be, uh, we'd all remember that. I just so, wanted to ask one quick question. Yep. For for the hydrochloric acid, um, I, I think I remember it's found in the stomach. So when we drink water, is is that one of the is is water the only thing that would neutralize that acid? No, the water doesn't neutralize it. You need hydrochloric acid in your stomach. Uh, it is what denatures protein. So that's why we have stomach acid. Uh, our stomach has a mucus lining. If you eat healthy, that mucus lining is there. It's very healthy. Um, and so it's needed to denature proteins and to absorb uh, B12 vitamin. It's actually the biggest cause of B12 deficiency is people taking all the antacids. So people take antacids because they believe they have their stomach acid is off, but um, it actually ends up causing more issues. Um, so the HCL gets neutralized actually in your small intestines because sodium bicarbonate is released and that neutralizes it. Um, but so that's a whole different thing. It doesn't, um, yeah, it, it's actually needed for us to correctly digest proteins. All right, there is this little thing that it turns out the pH plus the pOH of a solution is always gonna equal the magic number 14. And the reason for that before the pH and the pOH scale is there was another formula, which was that the hydrogen, or correctly, the hydronium. And again, if you want to say this as the hydronium, that would be lovely. If you want to ignore my hydronium, because you're like, I don't like that, and say hydrogen there and here. That's fine, it's not a big deal, but the hydronium times the hydroxide equals 10 to the negative 14. These brackets imply molarity. So any water-based solution, any solution, if you know the hydronium, if you know the hydroxide, that number, you should look at that number and go, that's a really small number. 10 to negative 14, that'd be 0.000000000001. This is a really small number. There's a really small amount of these in there, but you don't need much because this guy gives you a pH of seven. I'm sorry, um, gives you a proton. Uh, what I was going to say is a pH of seven. I'm pretty sure you all know this, is neutral. Um, pH above 7, so a pH that if, if you get above 7, then you're a base, and a pH below 7 is an acid. The lower the pH, the more acidic. The higher the pH, the more basic or alkaline. Um, so 7 is the neutral point because it's when these are equal. In our body, our body is actually always slightly alkaline. 7.4 is a beautiful pH. Um, American diet of sugar and animal products, as well as our high stress, not enough sleep, always looking at electronic devices, acidifies the body. It doesn't move it below seven. It actually moves it from 7.4 to 7.2, and then you get cancer and other all kinds of good stuff. Um, so eat healthy. Be good to your body. All right. So these are the formulas that we're going to use for the next 10 minutes. And you don't have to worry about this because we're not going to go there. So 
Again, you can think of hydronium as hydrogen, if that makes it better in your mind. Um, it just wants to know what's the pH. So this is not factor label. So for those of you who have not liked my factor label, you don't get to make any excuses anymore for this. You should say, okay, but you have to tell me what you're doing. So you tell me I'm finding the pH. You state the formula, negative log hydronium. Chemist, it's really hard for me to break that habit. And then you plug in. So you say, I did the negative log. You show me your work, 0 0.0555. And then you find your calculator, <laughs> which I don't have. I wonder where it went. Uh, and we should get 1.26. Now, there are no units for pH. It is just a number. I'm not going to teach you the sig fig rule, so we'll just go with three. Um, I just labeled it pH just so you can find it. It then asks us, so what is the pH? We just plug in. If the other thing I wanted to point out here, if it had said, would, if, if I had called this the HCL, uh, you would just plug right in. So we, we'll we just plug the acid in for right here. When we take chemistry 223, we'll, we'll worry more about the intricacies of strong and weak acids of organic acids and bases and stuff like that. This is just kind of a quick intro. Um, I also asked them the question, what is the hydroxide? So this one I'm going to solve using this formula that the hydronium times the hydroxide equals 10 to negative 14. So state your formula and then solve. That's all you have to do. You state the formula, you plug in, um, you can rearrange first. So if you rearrange, you'll get right that we're going to divide by the hydronium. Um, by the way, because I'm getting tired, and so are you, uh, it is correctly shown as brackets. Brackets to a chemist, to a biologist, to a scientist means molarity, moles per liter. Those are units we're plugging in. I'm going to get tired. You're going to get tired. I'm okay with parentheses. Perfectly fine with parentheses. Um, it depends if you're, so if you take the 10 to negative 14 and divide by the hydronium, you will get my answer there. All right. Um, let's just walk through the next ones. Uh, you can you can punch them in and make see. On the next one, it wants to know what is the pH? So the question is, what is the pH? Um, there is one more formula, so you can put it up there if, oh, I'm sorry. Um, that will be on the next one. We'll do that. And this time it gives us the NaOH. So we can ignore the Na. This is my hydroxide. So there's two ways we can do it. I'm going to go through. There's, there's, you just have to tell me the steps. It is a two-step process. Um, so I'm going to do my pOH is the negative log of my hydroxide. And I'll plug that step in there. And then my pH, so this is step one, this is step two, my pH plus my pOH will equal the number 14, and I can solve for pH. Um, so you can walk through and play with that. The answer is 11.4. It does make sense because it is basic. NaOH is a base, so yeah, it makes sense. The pH is greater than 7, so it's something that you can kind of say, yeah, it makes sense. If you solve the first step, you should get um, something like 3.60, and then you would just plug in 14 minus the 3.60. That negative is not a subtraction. That's actually the negative button on your calculator um, that is somewhere. All right. 
And the next one, it tells us peas. Peas are delicious. They're in the tupa. That's the Sherpa soup that we made today, yesterday. Uh, peas have a pH of 3.65. So we're going to find the hydronium, and then you can do the hydroxide if you want. So this one, I'm going to show you another formula. So about half of you have calculators where you could just plug the pH and do the solve. Those of you have those calculators that, um, like the Inspires and the TI-89 to have a solve function, you can just say solve and plug this number pH 3.65 equals the negative log of, and you're solving for the hydronium, and that's great. You can just do that. You would just tell me that's how you set it up. For those of us who do not, like me, um, to rearrange this formula, the opposite of, the of log, like the opposite of multiply is divide, the opposite of log is 10 to the power. So 10 to the power of the negative pH is going to give you the hydronium. So um, I should have had that formula up there, and I just forgot. So you would just do, right, 10 to the negative 3.65, and that will give you your hydronium, which is this number. Um, and I'll leave it for you to play with D. I'm going to move on. There's questions. To find the hydroxide, leave that also for you to play with these formulas. Um, so I think there's like two questions in your homework. Major, did you have a question? Oh yeah, when you put the P, the BOH, the negative log OH, do you plug in the 0 0.2, 0 0.0025? Yeah, sorry. So you would do... Um, I just got a different number. I don't, I could be wrong. Really? I don't know where my calculator is. Um, yeah, you do negative log of 0 0.0025. You don't get 3.6. I got 2.6. No, 2.6. I'm sorry, that's okay. my no, math. No, that's fine. I'm just want to make sure that I'm doing um, it right. That's all. 2.60. Yes, thank you, actually. That is the POH. My, my final answer is correct. Um, Thank goodness for major doing math there. So that's the POH for step one. And then for step two, we would do 14 minus 2.60. And that's where we get the 11.40, which is our 11.4. I don't want to talk about six figs. Um, yeah. My final answer was correct. Uh, Thank you. For you yeah. subtract the 2.64, you don't divide by 2.64 to get That's a plus. plus. Oh, okay. So <laughs> thank you, Mindy. Um, so I want to point that out for everyone. What her question was, the hydronium is times the hydroxide. Here you are multiplying. So when you're doing it with just hydronium and hydroxide, that would be multiplying and division. If it's the pH and the pOH, you are adding. Um, so yeah, just be careful with that. Um, so my answers, I know my answers are good on here, but yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. And thank you also, Major. All right. Anybody else have a question on this page? Again, your study set is the math. Um, we're gonna though talk about some chemical equations and um, so, all right, uh, we're going to do this page, and then we'll do the other three pages on Thursday. Uh, we're going to write chemical equations, and we're just doing double displacement. So you can go, oh, good. Everybody loves double displacements. We are no longer going to call them double displacements, however. We can say DD. Most students like to still label them double, either double, but there are three types. And so you're going to have to not just say DD or double. You're going to have to say 
precipitation, which you're going to see. Um, yeah, precipitation means solid forms or is a product. Oops. Um, neutralization means water is a product. Water as a liquid is a product. And anybody want to guess what the product is in a gas forming? Gas. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know if that's worthy, Max, of going on the board, though. That one's kind of, I know I was trying to think of something funny. Maybe it's a gnome. I don't know. Uh, gas is product. All right. So it's not in your study set. This is, this will be for next week's study set. Um, Would it be sodium sulfate? No, it's different for there's like so many different ones. Um, let's just go ahead and do the example. I was trying to decide if I, when I wanted to talk about the solubility rules. So this is where the whole thing here is we're doing states of matter. We're going to start doing states of matter. I keep alluding to them, um, and this is what Thursday's lecture is going to be. So this is kind of an intro to it. So the term solutions means what? state of matter. Aqueous. It is aqueous. What does aqueous mean? Dissolves in water. Aqueous means it's soluble in water. It's dissolved in water. So the aqueous means it's soluble in water. So typically are two react. I will tell you the states of the reactants. That was something I wasn't very good on on the study set, um, but here on out. So if you see solutions, so we have solutions, that means they're aqueous, uh, is calcium chloride and potassium carbonate. So I'm going to pause. I'm going to give you a chance to try and write each of these reactant, reactions. Uh, the next one is sodium hydroxide and sulfuric acid, and then I'm going to go through the states of matter and where our solid, liquid, and gas comes from. So I'm going to pause for a couple of moments. All right, I mean, go ahead and go for it. If you're still, if you're like cruising. Um, so calcium chloride, this is, we have to do charges. So it's calcium, this IDE means no oxygen. It's not a polyatomic, so it's just calcium. Um, so calcium is in the 2A, so it's a plus 2. And then chloride, right, minus 1. So we want, we want our charges because our charges will give us our subscripts, so CaCl2. Um, and again, keep your charges up above. All right, plus the and means, and we can show our state, it's aqueous. Or we can show that the end. Potassium is K. Potassium is a plus one. It's in the first carbon a column. And carbon eight is the polyatomic. So hopefully you have your polyatomic list handy. Um, so definitely have that list handy if you, right, in your periodic table. So... Our charges, the two comes down here, so K2CO3. It's a double. Oh, and this one's aqueous. And again, I know they're both aqueous because I said solutions. So they're going to switch partners. So we bring the calcium over in a double. You bring it over with its charge. The calcium goes with the carbonate. Uh, if they have the same charge, we don't need a subscript. So the carbonate is CO3. And the potassium. Always write the potassium before the chlorine. Uh, one of each, because they have a one charge. The two, two is going to be the coefficient. So that part, hopefully you know how to do. The doubles, we do a lot with the doubles. Um, so now we have to predict our states of matter. And this, the easiest way 
to teach you solubilities are the ones that are always aqueous. Unless I tell you otherwise, unless I say it's a solid, they are aqueous as ions. This is as ions in a compound, they're aqueous. And that is the 1As. Um, so potassium, sodium, et cetera. Anytime you see them, you got aqueous. Doesn't matter who they're with. They are aqueous. Um, that also includes hydrogen. I know I told you it's not a 1A. Acids are aqueous. Um, you may remember when we don't make them aqueous, how you would know from a name it's not. It's a really good question. You're all going, yeah, she talked about that. That was the last test. I need to know it now. That's hydrogen chloride. If we don't call it acid like hydrochloric acid if we if we name it as a molecule um anyway all right um they are going to be aqueous um there are some other ones but let's just keep it simple for the anions nick you should have all known that i keep mentioning nick swims nick is aqueous he loves to be aqueous there are three others i'm going to write them down I, I deal a lot with Nick because it makes it easy for me to teach. And in all honesty, in the past, they didn't get to have their notes. And so I kept it simple. It's like if you saw the, one of these four, you just say aqueous. So really, if you remember these guys, they are aqueous. Um, I'm trying to decide how much I want to complicate it. So the last page. Of your notes has this crazy chart there are all different types of charts like this this is the original one i taught with when i first started teaching 25 years ago and i actually like it um and and so they're giving you that up there that's sodium and potassium they also throw ammonium in um you should also add they're they're talking about salts um so that that's why they don't show the hydrogen and then there are the four anions. So these are, and they say almost all, um, those guys are the ones that are soluble. And that rule will get you through like most of what you do. Uh, these guys, insoluble means, insoluble means these are gonna be the solid precipitates. Carbonate, phosphate, uh, oxalate, chromate. So this page, it's more how to use it. If you see anything with this, there's the exception. This rule came first. Sodium carbonate is aqueous. Potassium chromate, it's aqueous. These guys are aqueous. This is the top rule. It's why it's at the top of the page. These guys make precipitates. Every one of these charts is slightly different and it's really frustrating for students. We're just trying to get the big picture. And then you get all these weird exceptions. Um, so the, the easy thing, one is you guys get to have the chart, is silver, mercury, and lead are called the heavy metals. These guys pretty much precipitate with everything. Well, not with everything, with chlorides, bromides, and iodides. And then the 1As and 2As, these guys are the, I'm sorry, the 2As. The 1As are soluble. The 2As are called the earth metals, right? The 2As, or column 2, the earth metals. They are called the earth metals because they form solids. They are common in the earth. Um, and so when you run into barium, it's going to be a precipitate, unless I tell you otherwise. Unless you see barium with Nick. Anything that combines with Nick the camel is going to be aqueous. So anyway, that chart's there. It's another one of those things you want really organized. This down here is what we're going to talk about on Thursday. Let's finish this, this one that we're on. All right. 
that page. So, you see an earth metal? You also have that chart. This is your solid. Carbonates also form them. Um, and again, we're going to be working with this on Thursday. Let's crunch through these two. So um, that's, a, that's at the end of today's notes. I think that was page 31 in our notes. There are other charts online, and some of them are really wacky because there's also, um, if you change the temperature and if you change the pH, you can change the solubility. So we're not going to go there yet. In chemistry 223, we, we go into it more. Um, again, if I tell you it's a solution, you're giving it aqueous. It's only on the products that you're going to be trying to figure out what they are. Um, all right, so sodium hydroxide is NaOH and sulfuric acid. We did this reaction earlier. So neutralization. Um, in some books that I've used, call them acid base. So you can call it double displacement acid base. You're going to know it because there's going to be a hydroxide and an acid. So it's the hydroxide and the acid, and you are going to get water uh, and then whatever else is left. So the sodium, right, if, if I don't remember if I talked about this, the first always goes with the last one in a double displacement and the middle ones go together. So some people, I know the tutors love teaching it that way. That's double displacements, they switch partners. It's, it's how we each visualize it. So the sodium goes with the sulfate. It is Na2SO4, um, just because sodium's a one and sulfate's a minus two. So that's where this two comes from. And then the hydrogen and hydroxide come together and you get water. You can write it again as HOH, or you can write it as H2O. That is a personal preference for you. I don't care either way, um, whichever you like. When you balance this, you will need a two, whichever way you write it. Pick one way and go with it. Um, for a lot of students in this neutralization problem, uh, the HOH makes more sense because they see two hydrogens and two hydroxides. State in neutralization, H2O is a liquid. Sodium, you see 1A, it's aqueous. When it's in a compound. And the two we started with were aqueous, and I know that because I used the word solution. Um, and again, this is not in your study set for Thursday. The study set is math. It's great at math. Um, All right, let's do the last one. So baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. Uh, bicarbonate, what did that by mean? Bye-bye? Almost there, bye-bye, two minutes. HCO3. It, it meant hydrogen carbonate, so HCO3. Um, so the sodium's plus one, and then HCO3 is a minus one. You can put a parentheses. If you like a parentheses, you don't need it. But that is sodium and bicarbonate and vinegar. So vinegar is acetic acid. Um, so in the chart that I gave you, this is acetate with hydrogen. So hydrogen is a plus one. And then the acetate is C2H3O2. It has a minus one and hydrogen has a plus one. Um, I did this one because this is the volcano many of you made as little kids. Mix vinegar and baking soda and you get fizzing. And it's really exciting when you're a little kid. Uh, acids are aqueous. Baking soda is a solid. All right. I'm wondering why I picked a hard one to show you. So they swap. The sodium is going to go with the acetate. Um, there is another way to write acetic acid. I'm not going to go there right now, but if you have a question, you could always ask me later. So the sodium goes with the acetate. 
we show the sodium first because it's the cation. And C2H3O2 is the acetate. We see sodium. It is aqueous. How do I know there is water present? When we started with the solid is if you have one thing aqueous, you got water. There is a lot of water. Aqueous means you've got water. It's mostly water. That 99.999% thing. And then plus, I'm going to write it underneath because I didn't give myself enough space. So don't write it like this. Don't say, okay, I have the hydrogen and the bicarbonate. Don't write HHCO3. I mean, hopefully, if you wrote something like that, you would giggle and say, what, what am I doing? Um, you would obviously combine the two H's and write H2CO3. So that's my other product. Now, we're doing a gas forming. H2CO3 decomposes into a gas. So my recommendation when you do these, and we will do these on Thursday, is you do the double displacement, and then you can cross this out lightly. Does anybody see the gas in there? It's what you're all breathing out right now. Pull out the CO2, which is the gas, and you're left with two hydrogens and an oxygen, which is Two hydrogens and an oxygen makes water, which is a liquid. Um, so there are several gas forming. This is one. I'm a biochemist, I'm not a real chemist. This is the one that's keeping your body balanced right now. You regulate your body's pH by your breathing. Uh, if you become acidic because you're stressed, you start breathing heavier to get rid of a lot of CO2. It gets rid of acidity. Um, yeah, people who meditate actually are more alkaline or more healthy because they're breathing slower. Does that have something to do with lactic acid? Uh, lactic acid is something different. That, yeah, that is an acid too. But um, yeah, the the biggest cause of our body being acidic is that we're stressed all the time. We don't appreciate that we're supposed to be very calm and slow down. Um, but yeah, if you overexercise, you can actually put yourself into acidosis also um, because of all the lactic acid that builds up. All right, that's our gas forming. We'll do more of these. I'm going to stop. And.